All right, um, I got to give you some background on this passage, mainly because I would really love it. This is between you and God, not between me and you, but I would really love it if when you go home today, before your toothpaste hits the toothbrush or your head hits the pillow, that you would open up and read all of John 7 and all of John 8. For the, we just don't have time to do it all. But, I, but because, and you've heard these little axioms of, of mine that I've stolen from others, but a, a text out of context is a pretext for trouble. That and the scripture means what it meant. But sometimes we have to do a little research to figure out what, what the original readers and hearers were seeing and experiencing when they heard and saw these things. So i got to give you a little background on this. Number one, John, last week we were at Passover, right? That Jesus was, was at the Passover festival and he, he healed the, he healed the, the invalid who had been there. And, and he had some other teaching to, to, to do there. But now John is a master of segue. He says sometime later... Six months goes by. Jesus is now, it's the fall, Passover's in the spring, uh, it's now the fall, the festival of tabernacles. And so six months have gone by from when they tried to put him on trial in John 5, the accusation, the multiple witnesses, him having to defend himself, he defends, and then he turns the accusation off of him and the, and the man who was healed and back on them. Um, so he left Judea, he left Jerusalem and went off to Galilee, um, where he's kind of uh, Capernaum, actually, uh, where he's wandering around in a, in a small town, uh, in a small region, preaching the good news of God. And then his brothers go, what's well, a feast of the tabernacles? Any good Jewish man is supposed to go up to these major feasts. And so his brothers come and say, hey, you're, you, if you want to be a public figure, you need to go up to this feast and, and do the miracles so that everyone will see you. They'll all follow you and you'll become that political leader. And he's like, nah. It's not my time. It's not yet my time to go up there. So he lets them go, and then he goes up privately. And then we find him teaching. Um, and one of the things that he teaches is something we won't really understand unless we know something about that Jewish festival. So I'm going to give you a little background on that. Number one, the Jewish festival of tabernacles happens in the fall, and it happens on the day, the culmination of it happens on the day where the daylight and the, and the non-daylight, the nighttime, are exactly the same length. And so, but what we might not know, uh, or might not remember, we've talked about this before, but the Jewish world, the Jewish way of looking at time is not like ours. I think of the day beginning when I wake up in the morning and the sun comes up. They think of the day beginning when nighttime, when the sun goes down. So their day starts in darkness and ends in light, just like when God spoke into the darkness and created the light. So all of the Jewish festivals, all the Jewish mindset, when you hear three days went by, it's, day, it's night, day, night, day, night, day. Okay, So it's not day, night, day, night, day, night like we do. So that's one thing. Number two... Um, in the fall, they, they know that the time, they study the, the astronomy very, very thoroughly. They know that, that the days are going to get shorter. And so there's this idea of we're going into when things are dying and when there's more darkness than light. And so their whole mindset is, Lord, bless us through that and be our light. In fact, we've heard, we remember, I'm sure, that, that God told Israel that they're supposed to be a beacon on a hill. They're supposed to shine brightly before all men. He tells us that in the New Testament as well. The people of God were always supposed to be people following God in such a way that people from all around would look at them and know who God is because of who they were. They were supposed to be a light on a hill. That's how they're supposed to, who they're supposed to be all along. Now, the Festival of Tabernacles... Um, we might not know this because of our, for, for us, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of moisture in the f summer, in the fall, and in the winter. To them, it's two or three months of drought. And uh, so in the, in the spring, they bring their sacrifices, their first fruits, and they say, Lord, we're going to trust you to provide rain that we need all the way through the year. When you get to the fall, um, we have water towers around here, but they have cisterns. We have towers, they have holes. And I've seen them, they're huge. Some of them are as deep as maybe this, uh, this sanctuary is tall. And they, they, the engineering in the first and, se first and second century B.C. and the first century A.D. blow me away that they could figure out how not only how water comes down from heaven, but, but how it filters down, how to capture it and how to hold it so it sustains them throughout the drought months. But to know that they're asking God for water and that they, because these things are getting dry by this time, they, they've, they, they've watered their, their livestock, they've fed themselves, they've, they've, they've done what they need to do. 
And then Jesus, early in chapter 7, talks about, I will give you living water. You'll never be thirsty again. You're never going to have a drought again. When he says that to the woman at the well, um, he's saying the same thing to her in John chapter 4. So I want you to know that water is a big theme in the uh, Feast of the Tabernacles. But the other big theme is light. And John is really big on darkness and light in his gospel. You can watch that theme develop all the way through. Uh, but in, when Jesus, at the end of the part that we're going to read, Jesus says this, I am, he's claiming to be God, that's the ego me statement, I am the light of the world. And we know, because of that passage, where he was standing when he said it, and we wouldn't know, unless we study those festivals, what they are seeing when he says it. He's standing in the woman's court where, um, where these five, I think there's five, I think there's five, there might be more, but these, show, I'm going to call them baskets, they're not baskets, but the, these, these things that they put together, they're offering baskets, and they're shaped like a ram's horn, like a, a shofar that the, that the, um, that the priest would, would, would announce the sacrifice that's taking place, this kind of thing, but it's in the women's court. Remember the story of the widow who offers up her might? She gives last of what she has. She's in the women's court and offers this. Each of these um, ram's horns, these offering baskets, uh, they're, they're in different spots, so you know what you're giving to. Like, if you're going to give to the poor, you put it in this one. You're going to give to the... But the other thing that you may not know is that in the woman's court, during the Feast of the Tabernacles, they took these huge bowls. And I'm not even... They're bigger than this. Huge bowls. It took many men to get them up on these stands. They filled them with oil, like lamp oil. And then this is just a weird little thing. The wicks to light them were the old undergarments of the priests. I don't know why their boxer jacks are needed. But at night, when this, this festival is, 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 is culminating, they light these things on fire. And there are five of those. And if you've ever seen the western wall of the temple, you know that it's kind of white, almost yellow, but more white than yellow, uh, stone. And in the woman's court, there's just all these stone edifices around them. Um, and at night, there's no ambient light like we have at night. We don't have street lights. When they light these things, it was said that all of Jerusalem was lit up. Jerusalem becomes a beacon on a hill so that all around can see who their God is. So when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, he's saying what this represents points back to me and I point you to the Father. So you need to know that going in. The last thing, context, I know it seems like a long intro, but I think that you'll understand these things a little bit better. If you have a Bible and you look at John chapter 7, verse 53 through 8, 11, you'll see a little line or a little mark, mine and, my, and sometimes a little note. It says, the earliest and most reliable manuscripts and other ancient witnesses do not have John 5, 7, 53 through 8, 11. What's going on? Why that make it in the Bible if, we, if our most reliable manuscripts don't have it? I just want you to know, my Bible was, was copyrighted in 1984. Um, and they did not have the Greek uh, versions of this woman caught in adultery story. They were all confident that it was a Jesus story. He'd been floating around uh, the, the Christian world for quite some time, but some of them knew what we've just discovered. They knew that there were Hebrew versions of the Gospels, and they dated back to 60 AD. We, that's what we know. We've, they've been found in the Vatican basement. One, a Gospel according to John, found in the Vatican basement in kind of a miscellaneous trash bin. And the pictures have been taken. They've done the study. They know that they come from about 60 AD, and they had consulted those. We've lost them, but they knew them. They consulted those, and this is where... Those earlier manuscripts are earlier by 90 years than what we have in Greek. They have this passage in John right here. I just want you to know that the more we study, the more we learn, the more we find out that the scripture we have is exactly the scripture God wanted us to have. And he orchestrated it and put things out there to confirm to us that this is what he wants us to know. So that passage is here for a reason. And I'm going to ask you to do two things. I'm going to pray, but I'm going to ask you throughout the message to do two things. Compare and contrast. I want you to compare Jesus' heart and spirit to the woman and the heart and spirit of the people that bring the woman. And then I want you to compare the heart and spirit of Jesus with his accusers and the religious re rulers. But I also want to ask you to compare and contrast you. Are you more like the woman are you more like the accusers or are you more like the religious leaders? We have a tendency to identify with the people in need and not the people that are creating the need. We have a tendency to identify with the heroes of the story 
and not with the people that Jesus has some harsh words for. I think, so you know where we're headed, that Jesus is saying the same thing to the woman that he's saying to all the rest of them. So let's pray. We'll do this passage and go from there. Almighty God, we bless you and thank you for your scripture. And as your scripture is proclaimed, Lord, I'm going to ask that you stand on my feet, that you think with my brain and that you speak with my mouth, that you give us ears to hear and eyes to see so that we hear and see what you want us to see, that you give us softened hearts to receive your gospel, your word, that double-edged sword so that it, it, it pierces what it needs to pierce, it comforts what it needs to comfort, and it offers mercy where, it need, where we need mercy. Lord, this is not my message for them, but your message for us. So speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. But Jesus went up, uh, but Jesus went up to the Mount of Olives. And so he had been around, and he, at nighttime he went up to a buddy's house in Bethany. It's just off the east, east slope of the Mount of Olives. Um, so Jesus stayed with a buddy whenever he was in Jerusalem. Um, at dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him. And he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. Now, those of you who are young, I'm going to be careful here. You can ask your parents later if they want to tell you what adultery is. I will be very careful. Um, I will use verbiage that adults might understand and others don't. So I'm sorry if I lose you a little bit, but I also want to be sensitive. And now that I highlighted that, everyone's going, What's, what is it? They brought a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? And then there's a little editorial note here. Uh, John, the author, says they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. And I want you to know how big of a trap this was. There, I never, ever, ever, and I got a pretty quick brain most of the time, but I never could have come up with what Jesus came up with. Because here's, first of all, we know this woman is betrothed. She's engaged. That's a legally binding thing. Like Mary with Joseph, Jesus' mother, Mary, and Joseph, they were betrothed when Jesus was conceived, but they weren't actually married. But nevertheless, there's a legal, you, you are faithful only to that person, and you are not supposed to consummate that relationship until, but if you do consummate with another that you're, be, other than the person you're betrothed to, it's adultery. So we know that it's an engaged woman because the law said to stone an engaged woman, but to strangle a married woman if she's caught in adultery. The other thing that we should know here is where's the dude? He's nowhere to be seen. And you need two witnesses to make an accusation like this, and you have to be able to identify the people. You have to have seen them. You had to see, bo you had to see body movements. So you had to trap them, or you at least had to be in a spot and see what you shouldn't see. So I don't know where the dude is. It's obviously a setup. They're using this woman to, they're exploiting this woman and her shame in order to get and entrap Jesus. I hate the fact that anyone would behave that way, but that's the situation this woman finds herself in and that Jesus finds himself in. Now, the way we know he's entrapped is this. The Jews has handed out, or the, the Romans had taken away capital punishment from the Jews. Remember when Jesus was, when he was tried and when, before he was crucified, they handed him off to the Romans, off to Pilate, and had him do it because they were not allowed legally to execute anyone. So if he says stoner, then he's, a, he's an insurrectionist, he's rising up against Rome, Rome's going to get him. And if he says, no, leave her be, then no prophet, no one of God would stand against Moses, so he's a heretic. So there's no way out. He's either an insurrectionist and Rome's going to kill him, or he's not of Moses and we're going to turn the people against him. That's what they put in front of him. But Jesus bent down and, stared, uh, and started to write on the ground with his finger. And when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, kill the woman. No, he didn't. That's not what he said. If any of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. Now, some cool things here. There's an off. If you read commentaries, you will find I have people absolutely convinced that uh, com commentators, uh, scholars that are absolutely convinced that they know exactly what scripture Jesus was writing in the, in the dust. 
Um, others, it's the Ten Commandments. Others, it's the name of every man out there who's accusing this woman. Others, it's all the sins of those men that are accusing this woman. I think he's doodling. And here's why. Okay, I don't have any theological reason behind it. It's a sociological reason. This woman, I want you to just picture something for a second. And this is going to be a little far-fetched, but I want you to, you know how when you go into the, re- to the bathroom and you're taking a shower and you, le- you usually you don't take your phone in there, at least unless you, I, that would be weird. Um, you leave it on your bed or you leave it on the charger, but every now and then when you're coming out of the shower, the phone's ringing and you're worried that one of your kids or someone might be in trouble, so you, you walk out into your bedroom in all your glory to grab your phone. Now, what if you, that kind of thing happened and you walked out and there's someone that you don't know standing there? What are you going to do? Hey. <laughs> no. You're going to... And you're going to ask him to leave, and you're going to, or you're going to grab a bedsheet. You're going to do anything you can. I don't think these men, if they're willing to entrap this woman, are going to say, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, we just saw a body movement, and we saw your face, and we saw the dude, and we saw what you were doing. So we're just going to turn around now, and why don't you put on your clothes and then come with us? She's got a bedsheet on, at most, and she's standing at the, in the courts of the temple in front of dozens of men. She is shameful. She's having a shame storm. She's humiliated. She will now have a scarlet letter. Everyone will know her sin for the rest of her life. And and they're trying to say, kill her. And gee, what happens? They're all looking at her because they're dudes. And they're trying to get Jesus to, and he goes, and he starts doodling. Where do their eyes go? Off of her onto the ground. And then he looks, they keep questioning him, and he looks up and he says, anyone of you who's never messed up, you chucked a rock at her. By the way, the law was that if you brought an accusation like this that required stoning, that you're, if you, the two witnesses, you have to, you have to throw the first stone. It's your honor and your duty. Now, there's one other thing going on here that may be going on here. I don't know. I'm researching. If I ever find out that I've got it, I'll tell you. If I find out that it's not true, I'll tell you. Sometimes people invent legends. Um, but I just think it's cool. It's a, it's a good way of thinking that there might be something else going on here. There is a legend that there's an old rabbi tradition that, that, that when someone brought an accusation, not just adultery, but any accusation, they came to the temple courts and the person that was arbitrating that charge, he would, he would grab a chalice of wine and he would reach down into the dust and he would sprinkle the dust in the, in the chalice because all the prophets had walked in the dust and he put it in there, and the wine represents blood. And he would say, on the blood of the prophet, swear to me that your accusation and your testimony are true. Now, I don't know if that's what was happening or not. But if it was, when he's going down into the dirt, they're going, uh-oh. He's propelling with chalice. He's going to ask us if our motives and our accusation are true. And he looks up and he says, any one of you who is without sin, you throw the first stone. And they leave. Hold his first at this, those who, heard, uh, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the oldest ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. And Jesus straightened up and he asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No, no, no one, sir. Then neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. Go now and leave your life of sin. I, I think it's beautiful that Jesus treated her with dignity and respect. There's no way when those men left and Jesus stood up and he turned and faced her that he checked her out. There's no way that happened. He looked her in the eye, the God of the universe, the word made flesh, the, the, the God, God with skin on, he, the incarnate one, the Emmanuel, God with us, the one who moved in next door. He looked a woman in the eye who was shame-filled, who actually did what she's been accused of doing. She was caught red-handed, red-skinned, however you want to put it. There is no way this did not happen. And he looked at her and he said, I am not going to condemn you. I offer you mercy and grace and forgiveness. So on his words, but that's what he's doing. And he said, now go and don't do it anymore. Now we have no idea if she left her life of sin She might have been like the rich young man who came to Jesus and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Keep the commandments. I've done all that since I was a kid. One thing you lack, sell everything you have, give to the poor, follow me. And the guy walked away. And according to that story, that guy is not destined for heaven. We have no idea what happened here, but we do know this. That even the worst of things, 
Jesus is going to treat the, the, the one accused, the one who's wrong, the one who's done something awful. He's going to offer them mercy, offer them grace, treat them with dignity and respect, and offer them forgiveness if they will receive it. So if you are someone who's full of shame, if you've got things that you've done in your past that you won't even want, you never want your spouse to find out about it, or you hope to God your kids never hear about, and you think, oh, if my pastor knew, if you've got that thing or those things, those thoughts, the things that you've done in your past, where you, 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 you are hoping beyond hope that God didn't notice, then this woman is for you. How does God treat people who have messed it up big time? Just like he did with a woman at the well. And just like he did with a woman caught in adultery. Just like he did with all of them. I don't condemn you. But change. Because all of the shame, all the difficulty, all the hurt, all the humiliation, the scarlet letter that she's going to wear is of her own doing. And Jesus wants to see her change, but he's also going to give her the Holy Spirit to give her the ability to change. Remember the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Remember what the last one is? Self-control. There is something that we miss when we want God to fix it. He will offer mercy and grace and forgiveness, but we must receive it. There's an old story about, I don't remember what the president was, but there was some guy who had committed bank fraud or business fraud or something like that. He was in jail, and the president decided as he was leaving office to offer the guy a pardon. And it, I, I don't remember the guy. It, it, was, it wasn't O. Henry, but it was one, like a short story author, that kind of thing. And the guy refused it, and it went to court. He was, he's been pardoned, but he, he didn't accept it. A pardon is only a pardon if it's accepted. So the guy stayed in jail. Even though he was set free, slate wiped clean, he stayed in jail. If you're full of shame and you've messed it up, you've dumped on yourself, Jesus offers you freedom and forgiveness, not shame and accusation. I would encourage you to receive it so that things change and you become someone new. When Jesus spoke again at the temple, he said, I am the light of the world. Not these bowls. I am the light of the world. Whoever knows me will never, never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And the Pharisees challenged him. Here you are appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. Jesus answered, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid, for I know where I come from, and I know where I'm going. But you have no idea where I come from and where I'm going or where I'm going. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are right because I, know I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. In your own law, it is written that the testimony of two men is valid. I am one who testifies for myself, but the, my other witness is the Father who sent me. Well, who is your Father? Or where is your Father? You do not know my Father, or, or you do not know me or my Father, Jesus replied. If you knew me, you would know my father also. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple area near the place where the offerings were made. That's how we know about the light of the world thing. Um, Yet no one sees them because his time had not yet come. Once more, Jesus said to them, I'm going away. You will look for me and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. That's harsh. In fact, he goes further. If you watch this dialogue, the rest of John 8, and I encourage you to read it. But they're like, oh, our father's Abraham, blah, blah, blah. And, and he's like, no, it's not. Your father's the devil. You speak lies. So he's basically saying to the rulers that he himself set up from the beginning, the people that are supposed to be a light to the world, people that are supposed to be a beacon, a light on a hill, so that all the world can be blessed by seeing them and their God, knowing who their God is by watching them, and becoming part of the covenant of God with humanity. That's what, they've supposed to, that's what they're supposed to do. And they've gone so far, and they have such a hardened heart, that he's saying to them, you're going to die in your sin. And you're listening to the wrong voices. So I want you to compare the spirit of Jesus with the woman and with the leaders. 
And I want you to compare the spirit of the accusers of the woman and the leaders of the religious people toward Jesus. It, it could not be more of a contrast. But here's the thing I think we miss. Could be wrong, but here's the thing I think we miss. When we hear Jesus say stuff like, you can't go where I'm going and you're going to die in your sin, that sounds harsh. It sounds like Jesus' spirit is different toward the woman than it is for these leaders. What is his spirit toward the woman? Mercy, grace, forgiveness. What's his, his, his motive, his heart, his desire for the leaders? Mercy, grace, and forgiveness. He's willing to say the hard things when the hopes that they, might, that they might change to be the people they're supposed to have been all along. He's willing to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to people who want him dead so that maybe some, and we don't know what happened to the woman, and we don't know what happened to some of those Pharisees and teachers of the law after Jesus resurrected. We don't know. Paul went so far on one occasion to say, I would give up these aren't exact words, but this is what he's saying. I would give up my own salvation if my people could be saved. Jesus saying to his own people, you're going to die in your sin. Are you more like the woman? Are you more like Jesus? Or are you more like the accusers? Hopefully you go, well, probably none of them. But there's a reason that people think we're more like those leaders. Why does the world hate us so much? I mean, 40 years ago, if you were an elder in the church and you got jury duty and you told them you were an elder in the church, you would be considered a, a, an honest and upright citizen and you would be allowed on the jury. Now, you're a religious fanatic who believes in something like voodoo. The world has changed. But why do they have a misconception of Jesus Because we've been kind of judgy. We've been kind of mean. We've been kind of self-righteous. Not you, the church. We tend to look at people who say things differently and dress differently and think other things are important. I mean, we like to surround ourselves. It's natural to surround ourselves with people that are like us, that speak like us. And, and there's some things that we say that aren't really proper, but like I seen them and I went by their house for lunch. I'm just playing here. If you go by someone's house for lunch or you're driving by while eating a sandwich, I just never understood that one. Okay, never mind. I was trying to give you a little break here because it get a little intense. We tend to surround ourselves by people that are like us, people that think like us, that have the same views that we do, that, that even have the same socioeconomic area, kind of live in that same area that we do. It's perfectly natural. But that makes us an awful lot like the Jews of Jesus' time. They circled the wagons and they pushed outsiders away. What if God did that? What if Father, Son, and Holy Spirit decided to only stay around, hang around with people that believe the same things, that are the same way, that say the same things? Then we're all doomed. But that the Son was willing to leave the Father and the Spirit to come here to tell us the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so that we might have the light of the world within us. You know that Jesus not only claims to be the light of the world, but tells us that we are? He tells us that we are the light of the world. We're the beacon on the hill. We are who the world looks at. He says, let your light shine before all men so that they will see your good works and praise your Father in heaven. That is who they were supposed to be. It is who we are supposed to be. God has not changed his desire, his plan, his hope for humanity yet. Are we willing to behave in such a way that we leave our lives of sin, that we stop trying to make Jesus who we want him to be, but instead become who Jesus wants us to be? I don't want to quote George H.W. Bush, but I'm going to. Are we a thousand points of light out there? If Jesus can change the whole world with 12 people, imagine what he can do with 2,300. Imagine what it's like to go into darkness and you're the light. Have you ever seen a flash dark? Can you go into a bright, sunny room or a bright, lit up room and take a, a, a thing with batteries in it and go like this and see a beam of darkness? No, because darkness doesn't exist except by absence of light. Jesus knows what he's saying. 
You're the light of the world. And if you walk somewhere where there's darkness, if you end up in a situation where there's darkness, if you only keep light with light, it's bright and people can see it. But what if we take the light and we go to where there's darkness? It changes everything. Because you see things more clearly when the light comes into the darkness. That's what Jesus is saying. That's what he did with the woman. And it's also the same thing he did with the rulers and the teachers of the law. He's trying to say to them, you're living in darkness. Come to the light. And he's saying to all of us, you're not living in darkness. You are in the light. But take that light and go. Do. Be who God has wanted his people to be from the beginning. So compare yourself. Contrast yourself. If you're that woman, and I don't want this to, I don't want this one to fly away. If you're the woman, if you're, and I'm not saying you have to be female to, to identify with her, but if you've got shame, if you've got guilt, I want to promise you one thing. The reason you think about it all the time is because the enemy of God, the accuser, wants you thinking about it all the time. He wants you thinking about how nasty you are so that you will stay away from God. And Jesus says, come to me. Bring it to me. Cast your burden on me. He died for your shame. So take, accept it. And then let the Spirit of God, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, can live in you and give you the power to behave differently so that shame doesn't come, but light comes. Compare your, are you like the woman? Are you like her accusers? Are you like the leaders who Jesus is saying that you're not going to make it. You're going to die in your sin. Or are you like you should be? Saying, yes, Lord. Not my will, but yours. His will is that this world that's so far gone gets to find out how much Jesus loves them. And how he died for them. He wants to redeem them and give them a different spirit so that they no longer listen to the lies of the enemy and the accuser, but listen to the truth of Jesus. What will you do with the light he's entrusted to you? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this story. Thanks for your wisdom of helping people see where to put it and why you wanted it there. You showed dignity and respect and you offered her mercy and grace. You did the same with the religious leaders who wanted to control you instead of submit to you. Lord, give us courage to cast our shames on you, our sins on you, and receive and accept the forgiveness that you offer, but also give us the courage to see where we've decided not to follow you, but instead are asking you to follow us. Convict us where we need conviction. Comfort us where we need comforting. And just show us how much you love us. In Jesus' name, through the power of the Spirit that lives within us, for the glory of God our Father, we pray. Amen. <laughs> it's almost, I say this sarcastically, it's almost as if there is a God. That song, I didn't know. I told him what the passage was and a basic idea of the comparing spirits thing. But shame and fear, it's almost like God knows what he's doing. So if God knows what he's doing, it's almost worth following after him and doing exactly what he asks us to do, to become the people he wants us to be. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, goodness, self-control. Let's leave our lives of sin so that we don't die in our sin, but instead let our light shine before all men so that they will see our good works and not praise us, but praise our Father in heaven so that they can know the God of the universe who loves them so dearly that he will take away fear, shame, guilt, sin, sickness, everything, and make all things new. The Lord bless you, and he has and keep you, and make his face shine on you, be gracious to you. The Lord turn his countenance for you. So look on God's face. God smile at you and give you peace. And all of God's people say, amen. Go with and in.